Good evening and welcome to our Facebook Live studio here at Triathlon Queensland headquarters. Welcome to the Triathlon Queensland Education Series. Tonight the topic of conversation is a very important one. It is everything to do with athlete wellbeing, something I'm very passionate about and excited to get deeper into tonight. I'd like to introduce our two experts on the panel. We've got Paula Charlton, our Performance Health Manager from Triathlon Australia, and Greg Cox, our National Lead Sports Dietitian for Triathlon Australia. So big welcome to these two experts. Um, I guess just to set the scene on athlete wellbeing, we might ask uh, Paula and Greg just to give us a bit of an insight into your role at Triathlon Australia. So we might start with you, Greg. Uh, so, as, as a nutrition lead for Triathlon, um, I'm contracted uh, to provide a service to oversee the other dietitians that are working in the program. Um, and we, I guess, it's about putting strategic components within in their weekly training and also around their competition uh, that obviously relate to nutrition. A big key focus area for us is around um, their day-to-day -day training and making sure that their nutrition uh, strategies align with, the, with those daily training goals. Very important part of, I guess, our high performance team. So yeah, thank you very much for coming along tonight. And your role? Uh, I'm the performance health manager and, and my role is around uh, the systems and the processes to have athletes available to do all of their planned training and competition and to also have athletes in optimal health. So we know that um, having athletes available to do planned training is heavily linked to their ability to perform and perform well. Um, so the systems and the processes around having athletes available is, is a key focus area for me. Yeah, excellent. So lots of insight to get stuck into. So we do have viewers tuning in. So if you do have any questions, please post under our live stream and we will address to those uh, throughout the night. Uh, but we might get started into uh, the nitty gritty stuff that you guys want to get talking about. So if we can just start with, I guess, what are those well-being areas that you believe triathletes should put emphasis on? So I might throw to both of you for that question, if that's okay. Sure. How about you, Catherine? <laughs> no problem. Um, we want to make an emphasis, uh, I suppose, in terms of like the, the biggest things that are going to give us biggest bang for buck and, and biggest return for investment, I suppose. And uh, we call them, those are our big rocks and why we refer to that is, um, and we've got a picture there of um, rocks in a jar. So if you start, if you want to pack things into a jar, and so the jar represents sort of the capacity that an athlete has um, in terms of being able to maximise their health and maximise their performance. So if we look, if we put in the big rocks first, then we've got space for the little rocks and then we've got space for the sand. And um, a coach said to me as well once that there's also space for a beer on top. But if you start with the little things, um, you can see that the, the jar is overflowing and the big rocks don't end up being able to, to fit in. So, so we like to start with what are our, um, our biggest um, impact areas in triathlon. And I'll just flick to the next slide. And, and they're quite simple um, concepts, but complica complicated and um, I suppose time consuming in the way that we can affect those areas. But, the three key areas are training load, uh, nutrition and sleep and mental health and how those interact um, are very important as well. Mm. And I, I suppose I can start talking about um, training load because it's a double-edged sword. Training is obviously incredibly necessary um, to perform. You can't perform without doing an having an adequate stimulus, but then it's also the thing that can tip you over the edge as well. So uh, a careful balance in training load is really important. And because it's the thing that the athletes do the most, they spend most of their day training and then some of their day, um, you know, eating and recovering and then the rest of their day sleeping. It's tra training's, training load is really important and explains um, their risk of injury. And I'll just flick to the next slide. And um, this is sort of the relationship between um, injury risk and training load that I was talking about. So it's a, it's a U-shaped relationship. So. Mm -hmm. This graph, um, the vertical axis, axis is risk of injury and the horizontal axis is um, how much training you're doing. And you can see that if you're doing a, a low amount of training, you're actually at a higher injury risk than if you're doing a moderate to high amount of training. So moderate to high training loads are actually protective for injury. And this is something we love emphasising to coaches because often coming from, um, I'm a physio by trade, and one of the big bugbears of coaches is 
you know, physios uh, tell us to do less um, and tell us to do less training. Um, whereas here we're trying to emphasise that um, moderate to high loads are actually protective if you're doing them nice and consistently. And then, of course, once you're entering very high training loads, there's a higher higher risk of injury. So this, this U-shaped relationship, um, we really, really try to emphasise to coaches and athletes. And I guess, how do you sit down with athletes and coaches and sort of work through these sort of specifics? Is it kind of, you know, athlete by athlete or in, in groups or how do you kind of sit down and work those out? Yeah, good question. So sometimes um, we'll do it, do it as a group with an athlete, um, um, a group that is coached by, um, you know, a single coach and they've got a group of athletes. So sometimes we'll do a group base, but often we have to delve into it individually because each athlete's got different risks and susceptibilities. They have different training ages. Um, you know, the way we approach males and females can sometimes be different mm -hmm. as well. Um, so yeah, generally we would have to and it would have to end up being done on an individual level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess um, yeah, training loads play an important part, but obviously you know everything to do with the fuel and nutrition. So I guess if you can touch on you know those factors for um, for athletes, Greg. I'll just uh, jump ahead here. Hopefully be able to find the slide amongst Paula's many. So much great information. You have many as well. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't end. Okay. Yeah, I guess uh, just to broaden the, the discussion a little bit too is obviously our elite athletes are busy uh, training most of the day, whereas, you know, the age group community within triathlon, you know, they're trying to fit training in around bu busy schedules other than just training. So, um, and there can be a lot of things, I guess, you know, during the course of a week for an age group athlete that can interfere with that consistency of training that, they, that you might be after to reduce the risk of injury. Mm -hmm. um, and that the consistency for an elite athlete um, can be brought about by travel or, you know, leading up to races. But for an age group athlete, the inconsistencies around training can relate to work schedules or family commitments mm -hmm. or work or, work or study commitments as well. So that's a really important, I think, difference between, between the two. Um, in terms of tra training and nutrition, I guess if I just go to this slide here, this is a really neat slide and what it shows over um, on the x-axis over here is total energy expenditure and also energy uh, intake. So in the blue dotted line, you can see the energy expenditure and then in the uh, black line is the energy intake. So that's the dietary intake of energy. So uh, there's four nutrients that provide energy in the diet, carbohydrate, protein, fat, and alcohol, hopefully to a lesser extent than the other three. But this slide's um, taken from uh, the Tour de France and it was a, a study that was done in the late 80s. But what it shows is a really nice marriage between energy expenditure and energy intake. And you can see on, on the days later in, uh, in, in the sort of schedule here, there's a reduction in energy expenditure and that's because they've had a rest day. So compared to days when you know, they've rid ridden over mountains or they've ridden over long uh, flat courses of say five or six hours of riding, when they're not doing the exercise, your daily energy or fuel requirements are reduced. And equally in, in this uh, study, they show that their energy intakes reduce. Now, the reason that marriage exists in this environment is because cyclists have a whole team of people around them supporting them and feeding them. And interestingly, in this study, they showed that the cyclists had about half of their total energy intake when they were riding. Now, that's really difficult to do, when you, particularly when you're eating that sort of volume of uh, food. And I guess it, it does show that importance of making sure that your fuel is connected to your daily training load. And there's no innate drive for that. So as an elite athlete or as an age group athlete, you have to be planned around your training to make sure that your daily energy intake aligns closely with your daily energy expenditure. Because mm. it just doesn't happen by, uh, by chance. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And I'm just going to jump in with a picture of an actual one of our elites load graphs. So this looks a little bit complicated, but basically, basically it's just weekly mileage of one of our elites. So we started um, started at this end of the um, scale. This was off season, and we built. Um, you can see the blue and then the the red um, lines um, building up in from the off season. And then once we hit the green, we're hitting some nice consistent training loads, and it varied weekly from. Anywhere from about 
uh, 50k a week to 75k a week so that's 20 25k difference but but we'd still call that consistent training load because they've done it over a number of weeks so they were able to vary you know up to 25k in one week and so we you know purely from a load perspective this looks like a nice load graph and you'd say they're fairly safe protected from injury but it means nothing if they're not fueling adequately for those weeks and fueling for those 25k um, fluctuations in load and that's obviously just their run load that's not taking into account um, their swim and their bike and their gym and maybe any other other sessions pilates etc that they have around around that so whilst that can look look lovely from a, a low point of view it has to be matched with um, adequate um, nutrition, nutrition strategy mm-hmm. yeah yeah very interesting and do you want me to we can keep yeah. playing <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. It's great. <laughs> um, I'll just go and I'll show you some uh, in terms of some education for both elite and uh, and age groups so that this concept here is the concept uh, that you can apply to very broadly speaking in how you might manipulate your daily fuel uh, intake to adjust for either an easy day of training or a harder day of training. So in the blue is an easy day of training and the, the food that changes probably most for your daily requirements in terms of energy is your carbohydrate f- foods. Uh, your protein foods stay or your requirement around protein stay reasonably constant from one day to the next mm-hmm. although the timing becomes important but your overall intake of carbohydrate foods, both of your wholesome carbohydrate or nutritious carbohydrate foods and, and other less sort of more simple forms of carbohydrates so more of your sugary types of foods, they should be scaled up and down depending on your daily training loads. So over on the blue, you can see that your requirement for or the suggestion around whole grains is much smaller on that day compared to a hard, harder day where your grain foods or your carbohydrate foods take up more of your plate on those bigger training days. And I guess the other thing that probably does change is the size of the plate. It's not necessarily like representative of each meal, but the volume of food that you're consuming on a hard day on a hard day of training should be more than what you do on an easy day of training. Now the flip can often happen because on an easy day of training you've got more time to eat, mm-hmm. but that's not necessarily what your body doesn't know that you're going to train tomorrow or three days later. So it's about trying to eat for the work that you do. And so eating ahead of the work, as opposed to catching up later in the week or on a, on a day where you've got extra time is really important message. Um, and from this type of conceptual type of an approach, you, you know, we can develop plans that are really individualized for the high end athletes. And I mean, if you're an invested age group athlete, you know, if you went and saw a well school skilled uh, sports dietitian that m- knew triathlon, well, then they'd develop a plan similar to this where on heavy training days, the fuel requirements are adjusted to meet the requirements of those sessions. It's about making sure that you optimize the adaptation from one training session to the next in order to allow you to become a better performer mm. down the track. And I guess for, for some of our juniors or age groupers who are tuning in tonight, how how much, you know, how many touch points do you have with these athletes on a weekly basis? How do you present this sort of information to those high performance athletes throughout the week? Is it both of you working together? Is it once a month? Or just just out of curiosity, how how is this presented to them? Take you to another slide. Let's just flip back here. <laughs> Here's when we prepared. Yes. <laughs> So I think uh, when, when you talk about the interaction um, mm-hmm. and sometimes, uh, you know, we might have a touch point with an athlete uh, consecutively over a period of time, like each week or each, each couple of weeks, depending on what the requirement is for that particular athlete. And as a support network, we might then connect up and make sure that our messages are aligned mm-hmm. to make sure that we're heading in that, the athlete in the right uh, direction. But I guess this, this slide up here just talks a little bit about the overall um, support team that might sit around an athlete. And I guess in my experience in triathlon, when you have an athlete come comes into the, the high performance network, they can often come through a, a, a well-skilled coach or a development coach, and that development coach might be a new coach in triathlon. And so that relationship is the coach and the athlete, and that's where they start. And that's, mm-hmm. the, that's their whole support network for the two of them is the coach and the athlete. And then as the coach develops, 
they then you know can expand their network of people that then help support them support the athlete in adapting to training and obviously then improving from their training into competi competition and you can see here that that's just a sprinkling of the types of different support service staff that can become involved in a in a network and i guess the thing that i've learned is to be as a nutrition professional is knowing when to get involved and also knowing when other people might be more important for that athlete and at different times of the athlete life cycle and here there's some great photos of some of our current athletes like ashley general there and um, Emma Jackson still in the mix. Ashley hates me showing that photo. Um, you know, they as they develop, and that, that was 10 years or just over 10 years ago, that photo, 2008. And as they develop, different people become more important to them at different parts of their career. And that's that, that applies to age group athletes as well, I think. Yeah, great. We might touch a little bit further on the support network um, down the track. We'll just keep going on these couple of wellbeing questions. Um, there was some comprehensive uh, health evaluations done at the end of last year at the AIS with our high performance. I guess, uh, what key findings sort of came out of that that we can kind of talk to in terms of athlete wellbeing tonight? Yeah, sure. So uh, we took um, our top uh, tiered elite athletes and brought them all into Canberra to do um, an overall health evaluation on them to, do, to get a snapshot of where they are currently and what what we could work on immediately and also um, a second aim of it was to identify any risk factors for future injury and illness that we could get on top of prior to prior to becoming injured and we looked at areas of mental health we looked at physiology looked at nutrition um, I had a physiotherapy review uh, and I had a medical review. So it goes over a few days or? It was all done in one day, okay, actually. Wow, day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, the idea was to, to minimise um, time load Impact for them. Yeah. Yep. So flying the night before, they'd start testing at some of them five o'clock in the morning. Um, they had everything done in the one day and then we compile the results and, and get it back to them. So they only needed to be in Canberra for the day because it is Canberra. Um, and what we found um, was not, I suppose, unexpected, but was was really um, gave us a snapshot of where where triathletes are at in terms of their health. Um, we had a lot of female athletes with amenorrhea, and we can um, touch on that a bit more, I suppose. Um, talk about that because that's a really a really big um, issue and really really important for us, and and impacts uh, you know has an impact on training load, and nutrition, and, and injury risk. Um, and Coxie will be able to touch on this um, better than me as well. Uh, we found we had a look at resting metabolic rates for athletes, and I'll, I'll get um, Coxie to touch on that. Uh, we also found that um, some of our athletes had quite low energy availability, and that's again something I'll, I'll get um, Coxie to touch on. Our athletes had poorer declining levels of bone mineral density, um, which was interesting and something that that we've had to implement some interventions for. And we also found a high prevalence of bony stress injuries in our elites too. Mm. I guess some really, yeah, really valuable insights there. And I think we should open up conversation to a couple of those things tonight. So the amenorrhea um, topic, you know, why why do you think, you know, it is so prevalent and, and what, what sort of findings came out of that? So with, uh, we didn't, did we have many, like in our current group? Just, yeah, we had a couple. Couple. we had a couple. Yeah. yeah so when, but I guess more. Sorry, broadly, I'm so broadly, yeah. Do, yeah. yeah. So I think broadly, as a as a sport, it's probably prevalent. I think uh, from an elite perspective, it's something that we've been much more mindful of these days yep. than we have in the past. Uh, and I guess in the past, amenorrhea became a term in sport around the female athlete triad, and the triad was uh, around disordered eating. Uh, poor bone health, and then um, amenorrhea. And amenorrhea refers to the absence of a, a regular menstrual function. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other term often used is oligomenorrhea, when menstrual function is intermittent, so it's not monthly as it, as it should be. And, um, and I guess with the female athlete triad, the issue around that concept was that the, the, the thought was it only related to women. And obviously um, the same components can, that impact on women can also impact on blokes as well. And so this term uh, that's changed in sport from the female athlete triad has moved into this concept, which is called the relative energy deficiency in sport. And to be able to explain that, it's, it's important to explain this, this term here, um, energy availability. 
So put it to put it in a nutshell, if you minus the cost of exercise away from the uh, your dietary energy intake, you have a little bit of energy surplus that's left. Now, if that energy surplus is too small, well then your body starts to turn off some of the essential processes uh, that you would uh, normally undertake. So. So things like your menstrual function for women, that's one of the first things that, uh, it, that goes. Your bone reformation um, in terms of remodeling bone um, after, after the impact of loading, for instance, that's t turned down. Um, your, your sex hormones for both men and women, they're also reduced as well. And that's for women when the, the sex hormones reduce and that rolls over to menstrual dysfunction and, and leads to either oligomenorrhea or uh, amenorrhea. So for women, they have those early signs. Uh, for men, not so much. It's not as obvious for, for blokes, but one of the things that we do know is their libido or their sex drive. So if that starts to, um, you know, uh, I guess decrease, um, well then that's something that's also a bit of a sign that their, their energy availability is, is reduced. And I guess these are topics that I think need to be spoken about more. And I think, you know, we are we are becoming a little bit more, um, yeah, able to speak about them now. I guess for, for our age groupers, who are the people that they should go to when they've got these sorts of questions? Who Who's the best person to sort of seek advice from? Or is there a range of people or are there different options? Yeah, there's probably a, a, a range of people. Um, the topic around for, for women, for instance, and um, I've spent a lot of time in different sports and triathlon for many years, is having a good relationship with, with a, a female athlete and being able to have that discussion around their menstrual function um, if they're using oral contraceptives, because then that will obviously then, um, that'll put a blanket over it so you won't see any menstrual dysfunction because they'll get a, a, a regular um, menstrual cycle. So having a good relationship with healthcare professionals, um, like a, a sports dietitian or a, a GP or a sports physician, um, a physiotherapist perhaps, like those types of people, someone that they can can talk to around the topic that they're comfortable with, even their coaches, like oh, a lot of our coaches, they're they want to know if their athletes, their female athletes, are menstruating as well. Well, because and one of one of our coaches put it really well that um, he views it as a performance inhibitor, and it is. If his athletes aren't menstruating, they're not um, they're not getting enough energy to meet their basic metabolic demands. They're not going to have enough energy to train. So um, it's great that coaches now are aware of it, and we can try and desensitize the issue and mm. have have an open dialogue between the coaches and the athletes about menstrual function because it is just such an important um, indicator that some that things aren't right mm -hmm. and, and we used to think it was okay and we used to talk about well that athlete's probably menstruating enough but the thing with uh, if you, your menstrual function um, is absent or in, inconsistent well then there's other things, other hormones that are also downregulated. So growth hormone is downregulated. Cortisol, which is a stress hormone, it increases. And so you're not not only um, maintaining your body uh, adequately, you're also not responding to training. Yeah. And what people forget is that when you do a training session, like athletes see that they're getting them, them they're getting better because the next training session they do, they do it faster. What actually happens is that your body um, your respiratory system, your muscular system, your yeah, cardiovascular system. system, it all responds to that training session. And that's that, that how your body responds, that allows you to become the better athlete. Mm -hmm. And so you're actually, as an athlete, you're building a bigger motor over time. And it's about responding to fueling a different motor. And that motor is a bigger motor when you're an elite athlete. You can do more work as an elite athlete than you can as a junior development athlete. Mm -hmm. So. It's important to know, I suppose, too, that just because you're menstruating, it doesn't mean you you have enough energy availability or you're not in a relative mm -hmm. energy deficit. So whilst it's an indicator when things are really dropping off, um, having a regular menstrual cycle doesn't mean that you've got good um, energy like availability. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's still it's still really important that you're on top of it, even if you are menstruating regularly. But it it, it is almost lucky for females that we have something that tells us when things are going really yeah. badly yeah and like um just to high, highlight paula's uh, comment there like your your uh, bone uh, remodeling for instance it's down regulated after five days of low energy availability now your menstrual function 
you know, you won't see that like uh, over a month, a month for mm -hmm. a month, but your bone remodeling will be impacted within, within five days, which is a very short turnaround. So it's really important that like uh, for me, it's about making sure athletes can respond to their daily training load and so that they're flexible and they're agile with their food intake to be able to respond to a high training day and on the flip side of that, respond to a lower training day mm -hmm. as well. I think we've covered that off quite thoroughly, but if anyone's got any questions, please do feel free to comment under that feed and we'll just move on to a couple more questions. Something I hear about a lot is like stress fractures. So if we can just touch on why are stress fractures so prevalent and I guess what, what causes them? Sure. Um, and so Coxie, this is a nice segue into what Coxie was talking about as well. So yes, stress fractures are our most, um, or bony stress, so stress reactions, stress fractures, it's a continuum, um, are our most prevalent injury in males, males and females and, and result in the most time lost uh, from training and missed competition in, in our elites. And I, I dare say that would be um, reflected in the, the general population as well and age group and junior population. And so, you know, what what is a stress fracture and why does it occur? Um, bone, bone is living tissue. I know we all sort of think that bone is, is quite a hard dead tissue because we think of a skeleton and when it's all all dried out and you know you see a skeleton but it, it it's a living tissue and it um it turns over just like you know your skin would we shed skin and we grow new skin every however many days so um and there's two types of cells in bone there's osteoblasts which um make cells and osteoclasts which resorb um resorb bone so there's this constant turnover of making bone resorbing bone making bone resorbing bone and what stimulates that um turnover in bony cells or um, osteocytes is impact activities. So uh, the higher the impact, the more bony turnover you get. So say, for example, jumping is a really great activity to um, improve the, the density and the strength in your bones um, because it, it, it stimulates it the most. Running, less so because it's, it's more repetitive and less um, amount of your body weight is going, going through your lower limbs when you're running as opposed to when you're, when you're jumping and jumping mm -hmm. high or jumping off, off a step or something like that. Um, but regardless, I suppose, we, you want a good balance between the making of the bone and the resorbing of the bone and the turnover. And so where things go wrong is where there's an imbalance in that activity and, there's, um, and it could be because there's not enough um, recovery between your impact sessions. Um, there's now some theories around bone becoming deaf to repetitive low, lower level impact like running. So the bone stops hearing essentially the impact that it's getting and stops the response to mm -hmm. that. Um, so bone likes a heavy impact and then, and then recovery. So triathlon, that's tricky because you're running most days and, and running is actually considered a relatively low impact activity. Um, so a stress reaction occurs when there's there's not enough, uh, the bone is being resorbed more so than it's been, um, being made, um, to put it really simply. And nutritional factors that Coxie has spoken about can really impact that. He spoke, uh, you just spoke about um, being in rel relative energy deficit can um, alter the bone turnover. Um, and unfortunately, by the time an athlete experiences pain, um, the process is already well along long its way. So by the time an athlete, you know, feel pain in your foot or pain in your shin, there's often already a, a stress reaction mm -hmm. having occurred because it can take, you know, process of sort of six to eight weeks for that, that to come about. And then unfortunately, once it's already occurred, then it's time out of the sport. So it's, a, it's um, preventing stress fractures is, is an area we really are, are focusing, focusing on. And especially in that high performance. So I guess looking at our juniors, what sort of words of advice would you give them in, in terms of like avoiding or looking out for stress fractures? Like obviously at a high performance level, it's something that you focus on and they're, they're experienced, they know more about it. But for the juniors, what sort of, what sort of advice would you give them from, from both your areas? I suppose... Um, going back to our three big rocks and and why they're they're such they're such important um factors for us yeah. is because they relate to all injuries and not just stress fractures so training load um obviously is very important so um maintaining consistent training loads uh where possible um gradually increasing your training load when you're coming off a break or um uh 
looking out for peaks and troughs in training load. So a trough might be around travel or say, for example, age group junior populations, exam times, and you're not doing as much training mm-hmm. or, you, you know, you go on a family holiday over Christmas, things like that. So be, it, being aware of um, those troughs and then peaks in training load might be in like intensified training camps um, or, you know, you're playing other sports on top of, on top of triathlon. So training load's a big one. Coxie can talk to the nutritional Nutrition. factors. Yeah. yeah, I think as a, a junior athlete, it's important to make that connection between their food and their food intake and their fluid intake and their... How sp- much activity they're, they're actually doing. doing. Yeah. Yep. And also the sport. So a lot of uh, younger athletes, um, you know, they don't make that connection. Uh, and so they'll do their sport and they don't necessarily invest or, or make a strategic decision about what they're eating. So mm. I think if they're... If you're going out for a long bike ride, well then it's important to be plan planned for that. To go out for three hours and with a single water bottle, like it's just not adequate. Um, you know, particularly if you haven't had breakfast before you go out. So making sure there's a little bit of strategy, not in everything that they eat, but around their training session. So if they're doing a performance swim set, like at five thirty in the morning, like we know that if you're going to do a performance swim set and you haven't eaten something before you do that set, you won't get the most out of that session. And then if you don't get the most out of that session, well, then you're not going to progress down that elite pathway. So having strategy around your nutrition, particularly around your training sessions, is a really key component. So that would be my one bit of hey, advice. Great advice. And I'm sure that's something that our age groupers and our juniors are always refining. So, yeah. yeah, no, hopefully lots of our juniors got some insight into that. Now, I'm sure we do have some coaches who are tuned in as well. So we talk about the athlete support network, and obviously a coach plays a, a huge a role in that. So I guess um, when we talk about athletes' well-being, what how, what do you think the coach sort of plays in terms <coughs> of athlete well-being? And what role do they play in, in it? I think like the one thing that I've learned from coaches over the years is that they spend more time with their athletes than any other practitioner, mm-hmm. um, and so they they can they know when an athlete you know they dive into the pool in the mornings and they're sitting a little lower in the in the in the water or when they turn up they're a little bit sleepier than they normally are. So picking up on those cues and understanding what those cues might mean to that athlete, so I think are really important. Um, component and something that I've when I first started those those subtle cues that the coaches picked up I I didn't really value that and that was a long time ago um, but now I really value the insight that a coach brings and they, they know their athletes better than anyone and so I think uh, it's about getting um, some support services around you as a coach so that they can learn about your athletes as well and they, you provide intel to those to those support service staff. So it's not about the coach solving all the problems for the athlete. It's the coach having a, a good network of people around that that person or around themselves, and then using the intel that they pick up on to inform those service staff, because those service staff will then become much more effective to the coach in impacting on the athlete. And I guess speaking about the support network for our juniors especially, you know, what role do the parents play in that space as well and, and how much should the coach and the parents be be talking? How much should the athlete be listening to the parents or the coach? I mean, it's, it's one of those areas that I think there's a lot of questions around. The but, talking bit yeah. probably depends on the coach. <laughs> <laughs> but we just know that the coach is just so key um to to implementing any sort of successful um if we're talking about well-being or injury prevention or um performance strategy that it it has to be coach led or coach Mm -hmm. coach driven yeah Yeah. absolutely and then parents with you know junior athletes especially you know juniors still living at home parents are key i think that's an Mm. area um that's a little bit untapped for us at the moment i feel um in the junior space i think yeah we we do need to to be looking at how we can um involve parents more and and have their support because i i think yeah especially for parents are just so influential on eating habits and they might be the ones doing the shopping and they're the ones taking you to training or not taking you to training or, or whatever it might be so I think that's something we can work mm-hmm. more on. Yeah, I th- and I think with the, the parents as well, it's about um, not just supporting but nurturing good behaviours and some 
um, independence as well, like for, for their athletes. One of the things about triathletes, if they're in that development uh, phase leading into the elite arena, is that they will have to become independent. Mm. Like most of our athletes spend between May and September in other places other than Australia, and so where they have to be self-reliant. And so having good skills um, about about managing their behaviours, so managing their use of social media and making sure that they can clean up. and How they even conduct themselves, yeah, how they like travel. Personal how hygiene, they, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, hygiene in the kitchen, yep. their cooking skills. And that's something that now when we've identified as a barrier for our younger athletes. And even this last week we've had a dietitian um, down with Lorcan uh, Redman, who's one of our development a- um, athletes in Perisher, simply around shopping, um, cooking, food preparation, food hygiene, because that, that is a performance barrier for, for Lorcan mo- moving forward. And he'll spend four months overseas this year and he'll be sharing environments with other athletes so you want him to make sure that he's got um you know food knowledge and good food hygiene and also personal hygiene behaviors as well and he can apply that when he's on his own over there exactly you even talk about things like the importance of having knife skills like a good yeah. chopping board yeah good All knives the essentials to use. in the kitchen yeah absolute priority yeah so parents can play a really important role in that mm-hmm. i mean they can provide their you know their up or their budding young triathlete with dinner every night but actually getting them in, involved in that process I think is equally as important mm-hmm. as well. Now I know you had some great slides here that we haven't touched on so the athlete life cycle have we touched on that entirely in terms of support network athlete life cycle just don't want to miss any of your great information here. Yeah we had, I a, think so. we had a good look at that one I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. Um, so I guess in terms of everything to do with education there is so much information out there um you know there's social media there's websites there's the whole digital presence how does an athlete filter through all of that noise and seek the right channels and the right the right people to talk to about that particular advice everything about sort of well-being we were talking about this earlier actually before before this presentation started and talking about some of some of the barriers we we were talking about a um one one of our elite triathletes going to a GP and 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 saying, for example, um, talking about how how she was amenorrheic and didn't have a menstrual um, cycle, and the GP saying, oh, you know, how how wonderful, how great, you don't have to worry about having a menstrual cycle. So, the issues around some you know um, practitioners that are not necessarily sport specific or have a really good understanding of you know how important it is to have menstrual cycle if you're in in an endurance sport or any sport for that matter but particularly in an endurance sport so athletes do really need to be aware of what to look out for and and who you know who might be a good practitioner and who might not necessarily be a bad practitioner but for someone that's not necessarily experienced in endurance sports um and yeah, we were we were talking around the um, some of the issues issues around this um, having enough um, practitioners that were really experienced right. in this area. I guess yeah. it, it moves to the next point in terms of sort of the, the ages. I mean, ha- what age should an athlete be kind of taking well being seriously? Is it is there an age? Is it thirteen? Is it twelve? Is it when they're progressing through their career a little bit more? At what particular age do you do you think? I, th- I think uh, like we've got athletes in our pathway, like the elite pathway that are, that are young athletes. We've also um, been fortunate the para athletes coming into our program and they're not always, they're, we don't get them at 16 or 17, 18. So some of those athletes we've got in their late 30s, early mm-hmm. 40s, and we're managing performance related health issues in those athletes with a real performance focus. So I don't think there's any one time, and if mm-hmm. you haven't addressed it you know, earlier in your career, it doesn't mean now is not the time to address it. And mm-hmm. I think it's something that, uh, particularly in a risky sport like triathlon, and there's that really um, delicate balance of you know the swimming, running, and and cycling, and trying to find that balance. It's something that you should be looking at regardless of where you are in your in your career. And with anything earlier is always better. I was saying before this presentation as well. You know, as a teenager, I didn't know that sort of by the age of 14, you know, you should, it is normal and you should should be getting your period by then. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't mm. have known as a young athlete 
if I got to 18 to sort of question that and go, oh, no, this is something I should be having. I, I need to get advice on this or I need to seek help. So earlier is always better. Yeah. Yep. So as we know, we are live here. So we have a couple of questions that have come through. What are the key markers that we should look out for that may depict the increased risk in high load phase? So what are the key markers that we should look out for that may depict the increased risk in high load phase? It's a really good question. I feel question. like you've got a slide for that, Greg. It's a great question. <laughs> Just let me look through the 40 plus slides that we have. <laughs> So maybe, maybe this one here, I guess uh, like if from an athlete or coach perspective, um, you know, an inability to recover uh, from one session to the next, like fatigue's an important component of the adaptation process, uh, but you still expect an athlete to feel some fatigue, but then also be able to recover uh, over a period of time. So if there's that, lack of ability for the athlete to respond mm -hmm. um, to training, well then you would, you know, that'd be one of the earliest, earliest signs um, from an athlete perspective. We look at a range of different um, markers at times and you can see in this uh, slide here, some of the physiological markers, uh, things like reduced blood pressure, reduced fasting uh, blood glucose, um, increase in serum lipids, so cholesterol for instance, uh, and also a reduction in resting metabolic rate. They're some of the signs that we'll look at, but they, they're on the back of um, already athletes sort of red flagging around you know, some of those fatigue related issues. Um, look for you, irritability. Irritability, poor also. Poor sleep. Yeah, like inconsistent sleep. Um, Which is ironic because you need more, more sleep, sleep and better quality sleep, but yeah. you'll actually you find that athletes will have more difficulty sleeping or yeah, their sleep patterns are disrupted. They might want to sleep all day and inability to sort of wake up and feel refreshed in the morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And here's a few, like uh, I guess a couple of the other ones, delayed growth and development. And, you know, Paula mentioned that before, like uh, for young females, if uh, the, the onset of their menarche is delayed, well, then that's certainly a sign or a risk uh, for low energy availability and, and also for low, uh, for poor bone health as well. Um, recurrent injuries or illness. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a young athlete or even a, an age group athlete that's uh, you know, got a busy schedule, training and also working, and they're recurrent, you know, they're getting little niggles all the, niggles all the time or they're currently getting upper respiratory tract infection, so they're picking up cold and flu. People, oh, it's winter, it's a new thing, but it could actually be low energy availability. So if you're constantly getting little muscle strains or tendon-related issues and then and bone-related issues, well, then that would also be a sign as well. Yeah. The key too would be, um, and coaches are so great at this, like, you know, the the job and that so much revolves around planning training and planning for performance the key with intensified training periods would be to plan for it so ensure there's been a long enough build up leading into an intensive in, an intensified training period ensuring the nutrition strategies are planned for prior to and kept on top of during um, the intensified training period ensuring that there's uh, you know, it doesn't go for too long. There's adequate recovery afterwards, and sort of when in doubt, plan for shorter bursts and mm -hmm. assess the adaptation to that. Not planning it in times where other, um, where there's other stimulus and other stressors. Like a good one in elite sport. A good example is um, something like altitude. altitude. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a classic one for us. So adding altitude on top of intensified training just spells spells disaster. So. Um, and school holidays might be the risk for a young athlete because, you know, they're busy with school and then all of a sudden they've got more time to train. So training ramps, ramps up. up really quickly. So that could be a really risk area. And like Paula said, they have to have adequate lead in time. To be able to prepare for that. Correct. Yeah. Which actually leads to how do you cater for intensity versus volume in the nutrition plan and not just outright load? Outright load is the next question. Yeah, so, so I guess... <laughs> Very good question. Um, I know they're very, very good questions. Yeah. Be. <laughs> so I guess overall training load is in, you know, intensity, uh, duration, uh, and frequency, and that sort of makes up you know the overall load. Um, and I guess it de 
I try to define sessions about well, what's the key goal for that session. So is it a performance session? That would be typically more of an intensity type session. And it's more race specific as well. So it looks more like the, the times or the speed that they would be doing in a race. And so in those sort of sessions, carbohydrate becomes a more uh, predominant fuel source. So having good carbohydrate availability before the session and during the session is really key for those types of intense sessions. For the lower quality sessions, so the more aerobic sessions, we do know that training under conditions of, of lower carbohydrate availability might actually enhance the response to those training sessions. But it's still important to get the overall fuel in. You just might do it a little bit differently. So you might not do it so much earlier in the session, but you'll, you'll layer in extra fuel as the session goes on. And then certainly after that session, particularly if the time frame between uh, an aerobic base session and the next session is short, well then you're much more aggressive with that refueling strategy. So your strategies do change depending on what the purpose of the session is and that will the purpose of the session will be influenced by things like the intensity and also the volume. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else to add to that one? No, that's great. No? Just double check. Um, if you could tell the junior athletes who may one day want to be at the top level the best piece of advice, I know we touched a little bit on this before, what would it be? Can I, can I? You go back to <laughs> I guess uh, I'll just go back to a slide here. Here we go. And this is a, a, a slide that um, I've used over the years. And I guess uh, what I've got here is a swimmer, a triathlete in the, in the middle, Laura Bennett, and uh, also some runners um, to the, the right-hand side. And as a triathlete, you're trying to balance a physique and uh, of a swimmer and a runner and a mm -hmm. cyclist and you're trying to put that all in one package uh, to be an overall uh, best performing uh, triathlete. And early in my career in triathlon, um, there was some research that suggested being really lean um, was related to success in, in triathlon. And this was an Australian study actually, it was done in, in Western Australia. And I believe it was the 1998 World Championships where the data was collected. And what they showed is that the leaner athletes were more successful. Um, and so that sort of set up a, a messaging for triathletes to be lean. If you're lean, well, then you'll be better. And what I've learned from a, for a junior athlete, it's not about being lean um, or the idea of getting leaner. It's about gaining lean tissue or muscle mass over their careers. And the thing that often di differentiates our young females from our high performing females is not their leanness, it's actually their muscle mass. And, and you know, we've got some really good data around to show that our, our athletes that have been through the pathway that have continued to develop have accumulated muscle mass over their careers. So if you work on dietary strategies that create leanness through loss of body fat, you'll miss the opportunity to gain lean tissue or muscle mass. And so the strategy should be aggressive to support training as opposed to being um, focused on trying to lose body fat because that's not the focus of a triathlon or an athlete that's trying to develop through the, the pathway. Mm -hmm. Very insightful. I've got a couple more questions that have just come through. They're some very great questions. Just wondering how often you monitor those biochemical markers you mentioned in elite athletes. Is it something you do regularly or in response to actual symptoms? Done more in a research setting. Um, we we don't monitor them outside of sort of a, a research um, project yeah, yeah. regularly in our athletes. We do absolutely monitor um, illness symptoms, and that's done on a weekly basis, well, a daily basis really. Um, we know each day whether our athletes are um, training or not, and if they're not training, if they're injured or ill. But that's sort of a um, more of a reactive approach. Um, and then in our periodic health evaluations, so we've looked at um, risk factors for injury and illness. Yeah. I think from uh, like in terms of the how technical the assessment is, I guess uh, will influence how frequently we're, we're using those. Um, these are some of the assessment tools that are, are used uh, across REDS, so relative uh, energy deficiency in sport. And so the first couple are, are validated questionnaires that sort of I guess highlight athletes potentially at risk of not having adequate energy availability. 
Uh, and the, the leaf cue is it um, for females and the lean cue it's actually a, a questionnaire that's been developed specifically for males it's under development at the moment the the f hormonal follow-ups and like uh, Paula said they're not done necessarily all that regularly um, but probably I guess we're getting a better handle on that now is how regularly we should be doing them and certainly I think the plan is for our elite guys to be having those done annually um, assessment more frequently, more frequently yeah. Yeah. assessment of re resting energy expenditure that's done in response to an athlete potentially not responding to training that's showing uh, fatigue it's not a definitive tool for low energy availability but with some of those other markers it's important um, as a indicator for low energy availability diet and training assessment I think we're doing that like regularly and that's the one thing that is our go-to tools mm -hmm. making sure that athletes uh, managing situations in the week um, to make sure that they're responding to their, their training for that particular part of the week with those sort of quantitative and qualitative assessments around that nutrition training uh, assessment, uh, you know, they've been doing, it all being done regularly. The other one that's not up there would be bone health as well. So uh, we do that annually with our, with our, our elite cohort. Mm -hmm. uh, so making sure that we're tracking that over a period of time. The value of doing it through uh, DEXA uh, is that we can, while we assess um, both bone health, we can also, if it's done under standardised uh, procedures, we can also assess um, their lean tissue as well. So we can get a, a relatively uh, good handle on whether or not they're developing lean mass. And lean mass is everything that's not bone and fat. So that includes your muscle, your tendons, your blood, your vessels, your heart, all those brain, all that sort of stuff is in, in your lean. Obviously you can't grow extra brain, hmm. but we're specifically targeting in on muscle there. Yeah. I think in Australia we have such uh, an established area in athlete wellbeing. I think you know there's all the resources, all the tools, great people. Is there any specific areas that you both think that we can that we can improve on that we're working to improve on? I mean, we can't be the best at everything. There's got to be pockets of of things that we need to kind of progress. I think one thing in triathlon that we're doing really well at the moment is, and Coxie um, touched on this before, is um combining our disciplines in a like a coordinated approach yeah. towards this like we're, we're fighting it from all all the different angles so it's not it's we're moving away from what we call a reactive model of treatment which is you get an injury and you react to that and you see a practitioner about that too can we understand the risk factors that um the risk factors for our highest injuries and illnesses that we see and can we can we eliminate those prior to it prior to it happening and we're coming at it nutrition medical physio physiology we're coming at it um, from a combined approach and we're we're talking about it with each other for example like we mentioned before have you could have the best laid training plan and it could all fall apart if uh, the nutrition strategy is inadequate around that similarly you could have amazing nutrition and training plan they're not sleeping and athletes not sleeping well or mm. they're in poor mental health so we're really trying to to pull that all together so I think that's that's an emerging something that's emerging especially in triathlon Australia at the moment that's I think we're getting a good a good handle on that most definitely and I think uh, the investment that triathlon Australia has made in that area uh, has you know, in this last cycle, this Olympic cycle, has been far greater than you know we've ever made in the past. Which I think, um, and it's not about well-being. People think, oh, that's a conservative approach. If it's performance, if it's performance yeah. focused, because if an athlete's not healthy and they're not they're not able to withstand and also absorb the daily training, they they won't develop as an athlete. So. Um, it's not a conservative approach. The investment's been a lot greater, and I agree with Paula. It's a more coordinated approach. And just one last comment on that: it's a look, like Dexa technology has been around for a while. Um, you know, assessing resting energy expenditure has been around. Wow. So like it's, it's like a SRM crank. They've been around for mm -hmm. a while, but the tools are only as good as how they're used and incorporated into the system. And the system that's being developed and continues to be refined within Triathlon Australia, I think uh, there's been a, a number of steps forward in the last a couple of years in, in that space 
which I think will only benefit triathlon moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, Paul and Greg, it's been amazing to have you here tonight. Obviously, it goes without saying you're experts here in Triathlon Australia and Senior. We're really privileged to have you here. Um, thank you so much to our viewers for tuning in. You both will stick around for a few minutes. There's a few questions still flowing in, so uh, we definitely will answer those underneath the stream. Uh, but it's been fantastic having you here for the Triathlon Queensland Education Series. Please, to all our viewers, stay tuned to our social channels for our next live session. Please post your questions underneath the stream and uh, we'll get back to them as soon as we can tonight. Uh, thank you so much and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Pleasure.